Okay? So, what I mean by that is suppose you have a computation which involves let us say n variables x1 up to xn. Okay? Now, what you are saying is fl of c x1 up to xn is really the actual computation of x1 bar, x2 bar up to xn bar, okay, where x1 bar is near x1, x2 bar is near x2, xn bar is near xn. So, what you have done is instead of trying to analyze how much error is created, you have pushed it back and you have decided to view this computation as a computation of a slightly perturbed problem. So, the result that you have got is the real result of a slightly perturbed problem. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, if you have and this when I say computation, I, I, I could very well mean this is an algorithm for example. Okay. So, if you have an algorithm where when you apply the algorithm on the operands x1 up to xn and the result that you get is the actual result of the same algorithm being applied to a nearby problem that means x1 shifted slightly, x2 shifted slightly and so on then such an algorithm you will call backward stable. Okay? So, that is what you call backward stable. Okay? So, the actual result you get by using the algorithm is really okay the result that you get using the algorithm is really the actual result you will get using a slightly perturbed data yeah if that is true with the algorithm then you call the algorithm backward stable is that okay because you are pushing it back to the operands. Yeah, that is why you call it backward stable. Okay? So, in, in problems, for example, when we are starting to do lots of simulations of chaos and stuff, there you have like two, two, two initial conditions which are very close, you are asked to find a solution which are very far from each other. So, won't this really affect things quite a bit because. Um, um, yeah. So, see it is, okay, so there, there is a lot of stuff on chaos and I really do not know too much about it, but I, I suspect that a lot of chaos is more due to numerical methods than the actual dynamics, yeah, uh, because these so-called small errors might really be magnifying because of the kind of uh, equations that you have yeah and it happens essentially when you uh, simulate systems with what are called stiff nonlinearities where you 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 do you raise it to some high power kind of thing and um, yeah really speaking i do not know whether uh, the chaos happens because of the numerical methods or because it's really there in the but system. I I don't know. I mean, uh, well, yeah, analytically, yeah, I guess so. But yeah, this is not something I know very well. This still does not give us the actual error that will be in the final No, it doesn't. It only does it. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. So now the important thing is this backward stability that we are talking about this is the property of the algorithm okay but then there is also the data given to us the specific data which is given to us yeah now 
if the data is good whatever good means and the algorithm is backward stable then the result that you obtain will be very close to the actual result is the conclusion you can draw okay okay let let me explain that a bit more so if you have say for example you are trying to solve ax equal to b and what is given is a and b okay and now suppose you have an algorithm script a which will take a and b okay and as a result of this algorithm you will get x hat yeah so it takes this algorithm takes a and b as inputs and it gives you an x hat okay now let's assume that this algorithm is backward stable so a is backward stable now when you say a is backward stable what that means is this x hat yeah is really a solution of a slightly perturbed problem that means there is some delta a x hat equal to b plus delta b where here x hat is the exact solution is that okay a slightly perturbed problem x hat is the exact solution of a, of the slightly perturbed solution okay so that's what we mean when we say the algorithm is backward stable is that okay but this does not guarantee that x hat is near x yeah whether x hat is near x or not depends also on the property of data given to us so for example if you are given a a and a b where this matrix a is ill conditioned yeah and you use this algorithm which is backward stable then you are not going to get x hat near x but x hat is certainly going to be a solution of a slightly perturbed problem so if you remember that example that we did using a matrix i think it was some 5499949994998 and 4998 something like this we used yeah now you see there we were in some sense doing exact calculations huh? so if you look at the exact calculations the x hat that you got for the slightly perturbed uh problem uh actually we didn't use an algorithm there okay so let's let's assume that for trying to solve ax equal to b you got a solution yeah now that solution yeah actually that example we did not really use any algorithm so i can't really explain how the algorithm plays a role hmm? yeah but we were using the exact so you know we exactly knew what the inverse was so it was not really Okay. Okay, so there was that problem where you wanted to solve ax equal to b and this b was uh this new vector, you know, b plus delta b that we had used. Okay? And suppose as a solution x you got you see there we got a solution which was some 100 in the order of 100, right? So this b was this modified b but instead suppose you got the solution 1 1 yeah if you remember that problem when we used 1 1 we got some result and we had slightly perturbed the b and then we got the new x which was quite different 
Yeah. Do you have that problem with you? Can you dig out the numbers? Just, just a second. Let me just write down. Suppose this was the problem. You wanted to solve x1, x2 equal to this. Yeah. And we calculated at that point that the... Sorry? It's triple nine, eight point nine, yeah. triple nine, seven yeah. point okay. nine. Yeah. Okay. So we calculated this x1, x2 to be some... What was that? Some 100.7... 1000.7, okay, doesn't matter, yeah. Minus 998.9. Point, point nine. Okay. Okay, we know this is the actual solution, yeah, of this problem. Suppose you want to solve this problem, we know this is the actual solution. Okay. Now, suppose you have this algorithm A, which you apply on this data, that means this matrix and this vector. Okay. And as a result of that, it gives the solution x1, x2 to be 1, 1. Okay? But this 1, 1, yeah, is really the solution of this problem, 504999. 4998 x1 x2 equal to 9999999997 is that is that okay you have this algorithm which you have used on this data set and we know this is the answer but it gives you the answer x1, x2 is 1, 1. But this answer 1, 1 we know is the solution of this problem. Is the exact solution of this problem. Okay? And this problem and this problem, they are very close to each other. Because the A matrix is exactly the same. The B matrix is only slightly, I mean the B vector is only slightly perturbed. Okay? So, this algorithm must be a backward stable algorithm. Okay? Does not mean your answer is close to the real answer. Is, is, is the difference clear? Yeah? Your answer will be close to the real answer if in addition to the algorithm being backward stable, the given matrix A has a condition number, it's well conditioned. If that's the case, then the answer you get will be exactly or will be close to the real answer. Okay? So, there are two things. There are two things involved here. There is the algorithm and there is the data. Okay? So, the, it's the property of the algorithm to be backward stable. But there is some additional property that comes from the data. So, if the data is good and the algorithm is backward stable, then you will get an answer which is close to the real answer. Okay, so, for example, here, if you are trying to solve Ax equal to B and you have an algorithm, then if that algorithm is backward stable and the condition number of A, A is well conditioned, then you will have an answer which is close to the real answer. On the other hand, if you have an algorithm which is backward stable, but A is ill-conditioned, then you can say nothing about the answer. Yeah, is, the, is this thing clear? I mean, this, this is where the subtlety is. 
Yeah, so it is, there are two components involved. There is something to do with the problem and something to do with the algorithm. Okay? Yeah? So how do you check whether a algorithm is backward stable? For example, an algorithm which takes A and B and tries to get the vector X. Yeah? Now that's something we already know. That is, if an algorithm A uses the matrix A and the vector B and it gives us X hat, okay, then we do A X hat minus B, which I have earlier, which is the residual. Yeah? Okay? Now, you know, typically we say that if the residual is small, I mean, when you say residual is small, you mean this R, the magnitude of this R, must be small in comparison to the magnitude of B. We are again talking about relative error. Yeah? So, so if you talk about the residual relative error, R by B is small, then we typically assume that we have got the correct answer. Yeah? That's, that's not the correct interpretation. Yeah. If you have a residual which is small, what you conclude is the algorithm you have used is backward stable. In addition, if the matrix A was well conditioned, then the answer you got must have been close to the original solution. Yeah. Sorry. One instance what? What? No. What can we conclude? Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Of course, one has to show that for nearly all the data, you will get a residual which is small. <coughs> but of course, okay. So now we have two things. One is to do with the data, one is to do with the backward stability. Now if you specify some particular A and B, you can talk about the algorithm being backward stable with respect to that data. Okay. So if the residual is small, you can say whichever algorithm you used is backward stable with respect to that particular data. Yeah. In addition, of course, if the matrix A was well conditioned, then the result you have obtained is actually close to the real answer. Okay. Now what I want you to do is just think about it and try to show that this is true. If the residual is small, we can actually show that the algorithm is backward stable on that data. And if it is well conditioned, then the actual error is small compared to from what you have done till now, you should be able to do this. So what I am trying to say is, you are given the data A and B, there is an algorithm which uses this data A and B and calculates X hat. Yeah? When you calculate A X hat minus B, you get the residual and it is seen that the residual is small. That means the relative residual is small. So you wanted to solve A X equal to B. Yeah. Okay. So here is what you do. I say that this X hat that you have got is the exact solution of a nearby problem. And what is that problem? The problem is A x hat is equal to B plus delta B, where delta B 
is minus r. Oh, is r. Yeah, I have taken ax minus b. Typically, you have b minus ax. Okay. Delta b is r. Is that okay? Now, delta b is, so what you have is backward stability because this is small, which means delta b by b is small. Is that okay? So, this ax equal to b you wanted to solve, the algorithm gave you x hat, but x hat is the exact solution of this problem. Where this delta b, it says that delta b by b is small because the residual was small. Is that okay? Therefore, this x hat is the solution of a nearby problem. Therefore, the algorithm that you used is backward stable with respect to that data. Sorry? So, what the answer that you have got is the real solution of a nearby problem. No, that's not clear. Okay, the original problem was given A and B. You wanted to find X. You look at the new problem A and B plus delta B. This is a nearby problem? Yes. And what is the actual solution of this? It's exactly A hat. Yes. Yes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So the answer that you got is the exact solution of a nearby problem. Yes. Yeah. And why is this a nearby problem? Essentially because the residual is small. small. Yes. So R by B is small. Is that okay? So therefore, the algorithm you have used is a backward stable algorithm. Now, if in addition, A is well conditioned, then we have condition number of A times the relative error in B is an upper bound for the relative error in X. Is that okay? Therefore, if the condition number is also good, we can conclude that the result you have got is actually close to the real answer. But if the condition number was not good, you can't, I mean, you know, the upper bound is quite high, therefore you can't say anything. Is, is, that, is that fine? Yeah? So there are two things. One is the backward stability of the algorithm and the other is something that comes from the data. So whenever you have problems like Ax equal to B, that will be captured by the condition number of A. Okay? If you were just doing summation, then it will be captured by you know, the re relative magnitudes of these numbers that you want to add up, for example. Yeah, that is that is the data specific part. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. <coughs> so, for example, what we will often do is accumulate sums. Hmm? So you have x one up to x n n numbers. And you want to do summation i from 1 to n of x i. Okay. Is this backward stable? Is something that we would like to know. Yeah. So you see that would depend upon the algorithm that you use for summing this up. Okay, so one could. Okay, so it turns out that accumulation is backward stable. Okay, now what do we mean by that? Well, we have to show that F L of summation i from one to n of x i 
is really the summation of some nearby problem. Yeah, is really the summation from I, I, I from one to n of x i bar, where x i bars are close to x i. That's what we have to show. Okay, so I claim the following: i from one to n of you want some numbers x i bar which are close to x i. Okay, so I'll say x i one plus gamma i. Where gamma i is the error, yeah, the relative error, and if I show that this relative error is a modest multiple of the unit round off, then I have shown that what I actually get should be the result of a sum of numbers which is close to the original set of numbers. Okay, so I would show that this gamma i. Is less than equal to n minus one times u. This is a modest multiple of the unit round off plus order u squared. So if I show this, then what I have shown is the accumulation. That means summing up of n numbers is a backwards table algorithm. Yeah. Of course, there there doesn't seem to be any algorithm. There doesn't seem to be any algorithm. So what I'm trying to say is, whichever way you do the sum, it's a backwards table algorithm. That means these n numbers can be added up in several ways. Yeah, of course, this bound here is a loose bound. You can tighten this bound much more than this. <coughs> yeah, but whichever way you do the sum. This bound for the errors is guaranteed. That means when you take these sums and take its sum and put it in, what you have is really the sum of n numbers which are close to x x one up to x n, and how close are they? Well, that is dictated by this. That means the relative error between any x i and x i bar. Is less than n minus one times the unit round off plus order u squared. Doesn't that mean that? I mean, this is this is for the, that relative error is for, uh, for each of the x's, right? Yeah. So doesn't it mean that the more the number of numbers you add, yeah, this relative error actually increases with the number. Yeah, but it's n, right? Yeah. I mean, why? I mean, you're saying isn't okay? Let's say I've got some five numbers. Yeah. I'm adding them up. Uh, then the relative error will depend on the fact that you're adding five numbers. Yes. In a multiplication sense. Yeah. But that is so for each of those numbers individually. Uh, no, this is just an upper bound. It's just an upper bound. Yeah. Uh, you can make it much more tighter than this. Okay. Yeah. In fact, in fact, you can straight away say that. Uh, Okay, but of course, if I put this, then I have to say it's not every accumulation, but some very specific kind of accumulation, yeah, which is x one up to x n. So I add x one to x two, x three to x four, x five to x six, and so on. Yeah, and then I add these two sums, the next two sums, and so on. So basically, I have broken it out into binary tree. And so each each entity, if you like, undergoes only log two n additions. And so each time it picks up a maximum error of unit round off, so it will pick up a maximum error of log two n unit round off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but that means this very specific kind of accumulation. But this, what I'm saying is, any kind of accumulation is backwards table. Yeah, so it doesn't matter the order in which you add up. Okay, so how will we prove this? Should be clear. Huh? 
how to prove it? Uh, take, let's take two induction, perhaps. Yeah, induction. Okay, so why take two? Induction means. No, I mean, first let's take. The yeah, so the for n equal to one, it's clear. Yeah. Yeah, there is no addition you are doing. So it's clear for n equal to one. Let's assume that uh, it's true for all n less than m. Uh, okay. Let's say m equal to one. It's clear. And let's assume that for all m strictly less than n, it is true. <coughs> okay. That means if you are adding m numbers, and this is a number which is less than n, then the gamma i is going to be less than m minus 1 times u plus order u squared. Okay? And you wanted to add x1 up to xn. Okay? So, you have done some additions. Now, you have to do the last addition which will give you the complete result. Okay? So, you know, it depends on the algorithm. You could have done x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. You know, you could have done the sum this way. Okay? You could have also done x1 plus x2 plus x3. Yeah, something like that. And here on the other end, you could have started xn plus xn minus 1 plus xn minus 2 and so on. So, you have two piles added up and then at the last minute, you can add up this whole sum to this whole sum. There are so many ways of doing it. Okay? Yeah? So, let us assume that we are on the last summation. I mean, anyway, we will have to do, because this summation is from i from 1 to n, we will have to do n minus 1 summation. So, let us assume we have done n minus 2 summations and the last summation is left to be done. So, we will take the most general case that there is this pile with k numbers which we have added up. Therefore, you have this pile with n minus k. Okay? So, let us also for convenience arrange, rearrange x1 up to xn so that it is x1 up to xk which has been added up here and it is xk plus 1 up to xn which has been added up in this summation. Okay? Then by the induction hypothesis we know, okay, let me call this sum A, let me call this sum B. Okay. Then we know A, which is supposed to be summation xi i from 1 to k is really summation xi plus gamma i, where these gamma i's, because it is a k summation, is less than or equal to k minus 1 times u plus order u squared. Is that okay? And B, what you have is summation i from uh, k plus 1 to n of x i 1 plus delta i, where delta i is less than or equal to okay so in this sum we are using n minus k so n minus k minus 1 u plus order u square is 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 what i have said so far clear yeah and now you are going to do the last sum which means you are going to do a plus b f l of a plus b, but that is a plus b into 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is 
that okay? Yeah? Okay, so for A, I substitute this in here. For B, I substitute this in here. And therefore, what I have is summation I from 1 to K of Xi 1 plus gamma I into 1 plus epsilon plus summation I from K plus 1 to N of Xi 1 plus delta I into 1 plus epsilon. Okay. So, when you do the accumulation, this is what you finally have. Now, if you look at this, I multiply it out, I can say this would be 1 plus gamma i plus epsilon plus order u squared. Right? Yeah, it is gamma i epsilon. Okay? But this I can substitute it with 1 plus beta i, where what can I say about beta i? Beta i is going to be less than or equal to, you see gamma i and epsilon. Gamma i we know is less than k minus 1 times u and epsilon is less than u plus order u squared. So, beta i must be k times u plus order u squared. Yeah, But k times u, so this is less than n minus 1 times u plus order u squared. Okay, Because k is smaller than n minus 1. And then I can do the same thing for this product. <coughs> yeah, So, I can take this product and instead of that I can substitute again 1 plus beta i and this beta i will now be such that it is less than n minus k minus 1 u plus order u squared plus because of the epsilon u plus order u squared. Is that okay? So, I will get n minus k times u plus order u squared, but n minus k is less than n minus 1. So, whichever way I do the accumulation, this is true. That accumulation is backward stable and the gamma i is bounded by this. Is, is, the, is it clear? Yeah? Of course, this bound, if you want to get, then there is a specific algorithm, which is you have x1 up to xn, so divide it into two halves, and then further divide those two halves into two halves and so on, and then you add, finally when you have two, so you have a binary tree, and then you add the leaves and go up. Then in that case, you will get log 2n times u, but that is a very specific algorithm, which gives you this tighter bound. But any accumulation you do, this is always going to hold. Is that okay? Sir, we have assumed that uh, xi's are per represented without errors. Sorry? We have assumed that uh, xi's yeah. are represented without errors, right? Before uh, starting. Ha. Huh. Yeah. That's okay. So, so, we are now talking only about the algorithm. Yeah, we are talking about accumulation. Yeah, that means we are talking about taking the sum of n numbers. Yeah, and we want to know whatever way you take the sum, is it backward stable? So, what does that mean? What we want to show is that whatever result you get is actually the real sum of a slightly perturbed problem. So, if you had initially taken x1 up to xn, the result that you get is really the sum of x1 slightly perturbed, so you have x1 bar, x2 slightly perturbed, so you have x2 bar and so on. And what we have just shown is that whichever way you take the sum, whichever way you take the sum, what you are getting is actually the sum of xi multiplied by 1 plus gamma i. 
where this gamma i is bounded by this particular inequality. Is that okay? Which means what is really stored is the summation of xi bars. We wanted the summation of xi's. What is stored is summation of xi bars and these xi bars are a close problem to the original xi's. That means the difference between xi bar and xi is small. Yeah, the relative error is small. So if you look at the relative error, xi bar is really xi into 1 plus gamma i. So the relative error is gamma i. Yeah? And that gamma i is upper bounded by this. So n is some number, so it's some modest multiple of the unit round off. Yeah, so for example, if the unit round off was 10 to the minus 7 and we are looking at accumulation sum where you are taking the sum of a thousand numbers or a thousand and one numbers, n minus 1 is 10 cubed. Is that okay? Which means the result that you have got, this is 10 to the minus 4, which means the result that you have got is really the sum of thousand numbers where each of these new numbers differ from the old number by a value which is upper bounded by 10 to the minus 4. Is, is, that, is that clear? Yeah, the relative error. We are talking about relative error. Always we will talk about relative error, not absolute error. Okay? So, of course, one can now try to find out whether all the algorithms that we know are backward stable. Yeah? And uh, you could, you know, am I out of time? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so you could, you could just pick out any algorithm and try to find out if that algorithm is backward stable and you can start a cottage industry doing that. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, I guess a lot of it has already, I mean, the better algorithms has already been tried out. So what we will do is we will look at some of the algorithms that we have done till now to see if it gives us backward stability. Yeah, so, so what have we done till now? We have done LU decomposition. We have done forward substitution, backward substitution. So we will look at whether backward substitution, the way we do it. And you see, backward substitution, when we did it, we saw that there were many ways to do it. There were different algorithms, huh? the row column, the row sum algorithm, the column sum algorithm, and so on. So is, are these backward stable? Yeah, does it make sense if you change the order? And I think I have already told you that all the different algorithms is essentially the loops being interchanged. So does it really change how, you know, what result you get? Is the, are all the algorithms just like accumulation sum? We could give an upper limit irrespective of how you accumulate the sum. So similarly, is there an upper limit for forward substitution, backward substitution? Is there, uh, is there something for LU decomposition? Okay. So what do you think? Rest of the class? Okay. So we will see that it's not true that they are backward stable. The forward substitution, backward substitution is backward stable. It's very well. You can show, give good bounds saying they are backward stable, but the LU decomposition is not backward stable. Okay? That's the next step. So then you can show that it's in the very rare cases that you have 
It's in the exceptional cases that you have situations. You see, when, whenever we are saying, we are saying, you know, this error builds up. But, you know, as they say, they could also cancel out. So, in general, the errors need not build up. Of course, you can construct matrices where it will actually build up and things wouldn't work. But So, in general, it's not true. But you can do modifications so that for most matrices, it will be backwards table. Is it that same thing like, you know, single matrices are measure zero? Is it similar to that? No. Actually, it's not known. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's not known. But from experiments, you okay. So there are some bounds. I'll I'll tell. I'll talk about those bounds. Okay.